Conducting's about sex. It's ritualistic. It's, um, it's about animal instinct. I love that moment when you're waiting in the hall for him to come on. That expectation is one of the most exciting feelings. Trouble is that most of the time they don't deliver and you end up being disappointed. I think it's all to do with power and probably a lot of money. The problem is that most conductors don't seem to be that great at actually conducting. It's got to be the world's most charlatan profession. great conductor knows how to galvanize his forces in such a way that the uh, a masterpiece comes alive. It's the conductor who either pulls the reins or lets the orchestra play. It's when to let them play and when to dominate them. You know in your head what you want. Now the question is what you have here, how much you can put across to the musicians who regard you at the first moment as a sort of strange, hostile animal. My work with conductors is based on some survey work which we did both in London orchestras and orchestras in the provinces to see what factors upset them and what factors uh, improved their performance. Some 50% actually criticized the competence of the conductor and the comments were made were often of a lurid and quite stunningly uh, critical type. Uh, so that uh, they were often described as being vicious or sadistic. I think that uh, a bad, aggressive, unhelpful conductor will always produce in players a feeling of insecurity and nervousness. In my case, it's led to a nervous breakdown. And I'm not the only one. Many of my orchestral colleagues are suffering in the same way. Uh, day after day, month after month, I play for conductors who don't know some of the world's most famous music. Music which I've grown up with since I was a boy. And I play in a well-known symphony orchestra, so I'm not talking about little-known conductors. I'm talking about really big names. What we're faced with is a worldwide crisis in conducting. Ask players in any of the better orchestras how many conductors they like working with, how many they actually respect. And the answer will be two, three, four, maybe half a dozen at most. Which means that players in the best orchestras are spending most of their time working with conductors for whom they have no regard, and times working with somebody they consider an absolute charlatan. There are undoubtedly quite a few charlatans in conducting. An orchestra can save a conductor, which means that a charlatan can get up before them and they simply, as we say in the profession, pull down the window shade and they go on, they do their thing, irrespective of what they see on the podium. That's quite true. A charlatan can enter this, this uh, profession and I suppose go quite, quite far. The actual education of conductors is not on the same level as, as training of instrumentalists or singers. The amount of really good conductors is very limited and we don't have to go very far to end up having people conducting orchestras who are actually inferior to the standard of the players. Thank you. Bloody train, more than half an hour late. Didn't think I was going to make it. Why, where have you been then? York, afternoon symphony concert. Anything interesting? No, no, just the usual stuff. Embry's Overture, Rachmaninoff's second concerto, Beethoven's fifth. Who was conducting? No idea. Didn't look. I think there are about 10 conductors in the world that I would say, these people earned the right to stand in front, front of the very first class orchestra of the world. I think there's about 10. Perhaps. I might be pushed to name 10. 
If I'm talking about Yasha Heifetz as being a great violinist, or the Berlin Philharmonic, or the New York Philharmonic, or Chicago as being a great orchestra, then I'm talking about being pushed to name 10. That leaves an awful lot of people who are somehow making unbelievable sums of money and unbelievable images, public images and lifestyles from other people's art and blood. In the United States alone, there are 1,500 orchestras, 950 of them full-time professional orchestras. Are there 950 conductors capable of being able to stand on 950 podiums and create excitement to individual audiences? No. There is a kind of r range of competence now, which uh, maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago, um, uh, would not have existed. I think people took for, for granted that a conductor, uh, when he was in an important position, had risen to the top of the tree, knew his job inside out. But nowadays, I think you find conductors uh, emerging virtually from nowhere and suddenly landing big recording contracts and, uh, because of their big recording contracts, jobs with uh, major international orchestras. The amazing thing about the London orchestras so they're all great orchestras, is that they exist in a sort of a free market and anybody could come and conduct a London orchestra if they had enough money to buy the orchestra's time. I can remember being quite naughty the first time I came up against this. And yeah, the, the trouble is when they get too big for the boots, you know, you're prepared to put up with it, but when they start to have a have a go at you and he's keeping on at the brass you know why don't you play with my beat what why don't you play quicker and I, I said well you know well if you move your hands faster then we'll play quicker and I'm trying to be helpful of course everybody corpsed and you know he felt uh, deflated and I got a telling off from the, the council you know this chaps worth quite a lot of money to us uh, this week or so so um I I mended my mended my ways I'm not a professional conductor my real profession is publishing magazines uh, but some years ago I fell in love with Mahler's music and the music was the driving force which convinced me that I ought to try to conduct this one piece of music. It's the only work I conduct, Mahler's Second Symphony. My sense is that uh, many musicians are very dissatisfied with the problem of a lack of preparation by conductors. And I really think that the interesting question to ask is, how is it possible that some of the most famous conductors do not conduct Mahler very well? It can't be lack of technique. It can't be lack of skill can't be lack of musicality, it can only be that they haven't done the adequate preparation. That conductors get away with uh, not knowing the pieces well enough is simply because of the situation of the business at the moment. To which orchestra you ever come, you always hear the same sentence, we don't know who we should take as music director or as guest conductors. There are too few really good people around. And I think that's the reason why so many get away with it. <laughs> Just know, because the business has to go on. The symphony orchestras are mausoleum for dead composers. We're still playing pretty well the same music that was being played a hundred years ago. And conductors, as well as record companies, are hyping it for all it's worth. Hundreds of conducting students attend music colleges every year. Few actually make it as conductors. The ones that do tend to be white and are predominantly men. I was working at the State Opera in Vienna. And I was called up the night before a rehearsal and told that Abado, who I was assisting at the time, was ill and that I'd have to take the rehearsal with the Vienna Philharmonic the following day. So I looked at the score, went into the opera house the next day, 
and was presented to the orchestra by the director of the opera house. I think that the orchestra wasn't really sure who I was, and I believe they thought I was working in the archive as a kind of librarian of some sort. Um, so they were surprised that I was put forward to take the rehearsal, and they talked a lot and giggled and this kind of thing, but we started the rehearsal. And after a couple of minutes, someone said, um, but she's really conducting. And everybody settled down, and it was fine. It was a wonderful rehearsal, in fact. The great orchestras, they play so wonderfully already on the first rehearsal. And if the conductor has no personality and uh, doesn't know which way he would like the orchestra to play, then come some difficulties. I think one of the biggest problems is that orchestral players today are so very technically assured generally. There is a great, there's, there's a greater problem for them in a sense if they're not inspired by a conductor. And by the nature of the profession, I think it has to be said, the majority of performances that they give, I think that they are terribly frustrated by conductors who, who don't communicate anything. always inviting the rumored talent. Then I ask the orchestra, did you like him? Most of the time the answer is no. And if the orchestra doesn't like the person, I will not call him back. Even if the critics are good and he's not too expensive and uh, etc. And it's a real problem. The conductor can pull the wool over everyone's eyes except perhaps the orchestra and if you're lucky some of the critics. The public doesn't necessarily care about intrinsic musical quality, they're concerned about other factors and uh, if the conductor is charismatic and flamboyant and has picturesque perspiration, PR team, fancy covers on recordings and on magazines, you can bamboozle a large amount of the public for a very long time. In a sense, the popularization of classical music has occurred hand in hand with reduction in the number of available conductors. And through the, uh, the desperate need of this huge number of orchestras and audiences and the managers to keep the business going, to keep the ball rolling, to keep the audiences coming and the, and the stage filled and the concert being performed, you need somebody up there waving a stick. Anybody. Um, to, uh, to, 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 uh, <laughs> to be a conductor, first it helps to be able to read a score. If you could read a score, you then need to learn to beat time. One, two, one, or one, two, three, and, right? If you can do that, you then need to be able to use this arm independently of this arm. So that when you're going, ha dum di da 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 with that one, and this one is shaping or moulding a phrase. You've then got to be able to know what's coming next, and you've then finally got to be able to galvanize everybody underneath you so that while this is going on and that's going on independently, these are going on and they're watching for anything that might go wrong or anything that is going right. And then, if you can manage it on top of that, to express in your face what you're feeling in your body, then you're about 10% along the road to becoming a conductor. I'm always fascinated at the difference in technique that's employed by conductors. If you take the extremes of somebody like Janssens, for instance, who, for me, has a wonderful, clear technique, and you can see what he's communicating to the orchestra, and somebody like Tenstedt, who's the absolute opposite. He's got no technique at all, 
but it works. And if you could define it, in a way you'd destroy the whole magic of it. Conducting is a combination of emotion and technique. Music is emotion. Music is also a series of notes bound together according to a composer's concept. Leonard Bernstein had a very clear idea about what a conductor does. At his best, he could electrify, literally, not only the orchestra, to make the orchestra play better than they thought they knew how, he could also electrify an audience. He would make some kind of a closed circuit between the music, himself, players, and the audience. Conducting is a kind of holy expression. And Bernstein understood that. Music was created to express something. The question is something being expressed. That doesn't mean that you have the most beautiful pianissimo or that this is the fastest or the slowest ever. It means that something is being expressed. You know, that's very rare because mostly in our period, conducting, most conductors are like fast Italian sports cars. You know, sexy, fast, loud, and that's it. You know, a good ride, but uh, not really with a larger world of meaning. And I think we really have to get past that point where the conductor has been venerated as this absurd, overproduced, overpromoted figure. Because, you know, frankly, there are more important people in the room, or equally important people in the room, you know, and it's really now time for us to be liberated from the, the tyrants. We are now paying the price for media hype in music which is a new phenomenon, starting really with Toscanini and going upwards or backwards, however you like it, since then. Toscanini was actually a, a, one of the first real media experiments in big time classical music promotion on the part of the National Broadcasting Company. As you may know, Toscanini was until 1936 the music director of the New York Philharmonic, and then he retired David Sarnoff, who was the chairman of RCA, and RCA owned NBC at that time, was a music lover himself and liked the idea of bringing back the most attractive public performer of classical music of that time. And so his conducting was built up into this huge myth that there was nobody in the world like this man. His personality lent itself to exploitation. The mysterious, the great maestro, the temper, the, the, all of the things that went with it. But he manipulated the media. The media didn't manipulate him. He knew exactly who he was. He was a born showman. Someone once asked me, uh, tell me something about Toscanini. What was, what was it that made him so great? Well, if you as a musician asked me that, we could go into detail by taking a score and, and comparing. When the layman asks me that, I say, I, my answer is, well, Toscanini was worth being born for. He was presented to the audience not only as this brilliant conductor, the greatest of course, but he was also presented in publicity as a regular guy. It was said that in his off-duty hours later on he used to watch television all in wrestling. He was a regular guy just like everyone else but happened also to be the greatest conductor. He brought a kind of determined efficiency which exactly matched the American feeling of the time. That is go-getting, mass production money-making, enterprise culture, 
Toscanini epitomized all these qualities in music. So he was the ideal musician for the Americans at that time. At the moment when Toscanini was at the summit of his fame and popularity at the end of the Second World War, a British record producer called Walter Legge set off on a Harry Lyme type manhunt to rummage among the ruins of the Third Reich for conducting talent that he could apply to a new orchestra that he was forming in London, the Philharmonia. The man he found was Herbert von Karajan. Karajan was raised and moulded during the Third Reich. He was an enthusiastic early Nazi. He was also conscious of the need to control media, not just in the way that Goebbels had done in Germany by total censorship, but in the way that Toscanini had done in America by an orchestration of adulation. When he later went into projecting his own image, uh, he was very careful to control all photographs that appeared of him, not just on record covers, but in newspapers as well. He would always be backlit, underlit, as if by Leni Riefenstahl in her film of the Nuremberg rallies. When he started making films of himself, he applied the same techniques, the same lessons, the same concentrations. His idea of how to, of these films was to, to build basically a monument to himself. And uh, when, when one wondered and had the temerity to inquire, you know, who would be interested in these films, he basically said people who were interested in becoming conductors. And so if it was a 50-minute piece, he was on the screen 40 minutes. And uh, there would be occasional shots of the, of the rest of the orchestra. And uh, he would say, uh, you know, oh, no, no, we don't want this guy. He's ugly. Take the camera off. Take that out of there. You know? or, or the bassoon he thought was an ugly instrument. We don't want any bassoon shots. And uh, but basically, the films that he uh, was making were definitely a way to immortalize himself. Karajan was this sort of a marketing genius. He lived for it. He, he had a very concentrated life. He did not go all over the world just guest conducting. He did not, uh, I don't think he even charged very high fees when he conducted. But his main, let's say, obsession or purpose in life, musical life, was to propagate his electronic image. I went to the American Documentation Center in Berlin and I got a Xerox of, uh, of a card that was uh, a party membership card that said Herbert von Karajan on it. I gave him the card because we'd been talking about this and he had been denying it and so I, I handed him the card. And uh, I remember he took it over and, uh, to a lamp and he held it over the lamp and he stuck his face in over the lamp with the light coming up and he hadn't shaved in a couple of days and uh, just relaxing at home. And he looked at it and he said, this is false. This is false. He says, there is no signature. And for a while I thought that my whole case had been blown and then I discovered that one didn't need to sign those cards. He, he was a great admirer of Hitler. He would say this you know, to me. He admired Hitler. Thought he was a great statesman. Karajan was a great conductor, no, no doubt. He was a wonderful rehearser and he was somebody who really could uh, achieve things in a very short time and he had his certain kind of style but I don't think Karajan has ever been a Nazi I don't think so. he was not this kind of a person really to stand for something uh, as stupid as Nazism I don't think so but he used it in a way as he used later all the media and things like that and that's the same way he used in early days of course uh, the uh, political structure I mean these people were just opportunists you know. 
Karian got his position in those days. He never, after that, uttered a word of regret, of sorrow for all those that suffered so much, for all his colleagues. I'm just speaking about his colleagues and the musicians for those that suffered, for those that were persecuted, for those that were killed, and for those that were driven out. And nobody minded. They all said, yeah, all right, he was an opportunist. So. But maybe these people that were killed, they also wanted nothing else but to be in their profession and to go ahead. They couldn't because they were killed. So I can't really excuse opportunists so easily anymore. The name Karayan actually did, became a, not only a symbol of, of a godlike conductor, but also Karayan became a, a symbol of classical music, orchestral music being available for people who um, didn't have direct access to concert music, but they could go to the supermarket or the record store or bookstore and buy a few Karayan recordings. And, and in this respect, he did a lot of good. But I think one of the problems, of course, is that um, now you have Karayan's name printed this big and then Beethoven is printed this big. And of course that's bloody wrong. <laughs> Conductors everywhere saw the power and the wealth that Karajan amassed. And so they too began to shift their priorities a little bit towards the sort of control they might have and the sort of lifestyle they might have if they emulated Karajan and his activities. When the focus of the attention of leading conductors is diverted from making music into making money, then the profession as a whole is invariably weakened and the quality of music as we experience it is undermined. Many of our friends who stand on the podium and get paid more than an entire orchestra, I think that there's got to be something very loopy in the whole profession. I can make anywhere from I don't know, six to ten thousand dollars a night if I want. Uh, depends on the particular orchestra. Depends on the relationship I've had with that orchestra over the years. Uh, again, you, if you appear many seasons running, you just escalate your fee, or the agents do that, goes up, um, and it gets to a point when you've appeared 14, 15 years with an orchestra, you're making a good living. Rostropovich has been paid several hundreds of thousands of dollars to conduct the National Symphony. Um, I was in Washington for four years uh, at the National Endowment for the Arts, and during that time I would say of all the performances of the National Symphony, maybe two or three had sold out, and the rest you could buy tickets up to the moment of the concert uh, for whatever price range. Certainly when we hear that Lauren Mazel is being paid a tremendous amount of money for a very few weeks at, in Pittsburgh, um, there is a real question as to whether he is worth that money. In the cases of the music director, it's public knowledge how much they earn. The government will release those figures of a non-profit institution. We can we have access to them, and we know that at the time when the orchestra is pleading poverty, they are paying 50 gillion zillion dollars to the genius on the podium. And that may not be a, a useful bit of information for those who are trying to raise funds. Those who are at the top of their profession are finally, for the first time in history, truly deriving benefit from the, their efforts. Because up until then, the returns were uh, rather extraordinary, but they were going to the managers, the agents, 
the presenters, but not to the artists. Lauren Marzell, according to U.S. income tax returns for 1990, was earning $981,602 as music director of the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra. In addition, he was negotiating a deal with Bavarian Radio to conduct their orchestra in Munich for 14 weeks of the year. He also guest conducts and makes many recordings. Um, what Lauren Marzell has done more than any other living conductor is raised the ante yet again. After the publication of his deal with Bavarian Radio, the other conductor in Munich, Sergio Celebidaki, a very uh, revered figure, demanded parity. It was simply unthinkable that another conductor in town could be earning more than he was. And so the fees and finances of conductors have continued to multiply even as their numbers have diminished. I am in this profession for the love of the music, not to earn money, really. The fact that I earn a considerable amount of money is because I'm vain. <laughs> because why should I earn less than so-and-so? I'm certainly not the highest paid conductor, not at all. Some of the fees that are being paid in Germany today are indecent. We do hear of people getting a uh, you know, 100,000 marks uh, for a pair of concerts, things like that. Uh, it's, it's preposterous. I mean, nobody's that good. <laughs> I have in one or two cases turned back a fee if I felt I haven't done a proper job, really uh, have been a little bit embarrassed once in a while by things that I've done. Um, I wonder if someday we shouldn't be more on a kind of incentive clause, you know, we get paid a good amount if we do a good job, if we don't do a good job, we don't get paid so much. I'm not one of these people who believes that musical figures should be paid the same as sports personalities. We don't have the same kind of commercial appeal. We have a limited audience. And I worry that the future of what we do is in great jeopardy because monetarily, we can't be afforded anymore. the conductors who really make box office deserve to make as much money as they make. And this was the case in Karajan's case, was the same case in Bernstein's case, and that's it. Yeah? All the other ones cost money. Traditionally, a conductor would have one orchestra or one opera house with which he would spend most of his life. It was like a marriage. He might have other bits on the side. He might even have a permanent mistress in another city. But the, the commitment was there, and it lasted until death did them part or until, or until divorce and he moved on somewhere else. That was the commitment on which great music was made. Come the jet age, and certain agents suddenly realized that um, they could split their conductors into twos and threes. They could make them music director on three continents at one and the same time so that the conductor would be earning three very large salaries and spending no more than three months of a year at any of his posts. <laughs> Management is a key factor today. And there's a great deal of, uh, of mutual masturbation uh, of, an, uh, of an aesthetic and commercial nature in this field. Managements can piggyback a lesser talent on a major talent, and they can certainly make requirements that you, we will not cooperate with you unless you do such and such for us. I, I think uh, the days when the primary consideration was art are long gone. Well, obviously, there are certain conductors who are, are more equal than other conductors because they sell records. All these record companies are looking for the next whatever, carry-on. 
whatever. And obviously, if they find somebody that they think is that, they will market him as hard as possible. And they want to market him both in terms of the records and in terms of appearances. I cannot imagine a, a single record uh, company that does not want to get another two or three people in there. And if they smell out that there's a conductor that is going to be coming along, they're going to run like crazy for him. One of the most interesting phenomena in the last 15 years is the rise of the Italian composer Giuseppe Sinopoli. Now, at the beginning of the 80s, his name was known perhaps to a handful of contemporary music buffs. Then suddenly he had a recording contract as a conductor. Uh, and then in 1983, he was appointed principal conductor of the Philharmonia Orchestra. Um, after having done, I think, only one, but certainly not more than a handful of concerts. And what worries me is that nothing that I've heard has suggested to me that this man is one of the major conductors in the world and should be leading an orchestra with such a, a, a great tradition. And it seems to me extraordinary that this can happen in what was once regarded as the musical capital of the world. I think media hype and attention makes it altogether possible for mediocre talents to stand on a podium and uh, create something resembling a uh, sound uh, because so much can be glossed over in a recording studio or glossed over in making a film or corrected somehow electronically or all the mix and magic and voodoo of modern communications. I think that the reason why most classical concerts uh, the standard repertory, why these concerts are so boring or average, is because most of the star conductors who give them are using these concerts as rehearsals for the recording session the next day. And this is a big problem, that they have big record contracts, and orchestras need these record contracts as well now, that the, the public performance doesn't really matter very much. Uh, it's the CD and the advertising for it in the magazines that actually matters more. And so, in one sense, the conductor has this extreme power and earns a lot of money. But in fact, they're just the front men for the very powerful major record labels. And I think that the public suffers because a lot of people don't know whether something is a very, very good performance or a spectacular sort of experience. They just sort of think it must be good because this star conductor is doing it and this is a famous orchestra. The problem has been exacerbated, of course, with the phenomenal growth of the CD industry, which nobody expected. Then you had have had in the last three or four years this extraordinary phenomenon of Sony trying to get into the business. <laughs> and the way they felt that they could get into the business was by spending a huge amount of money and losing a huge amount of money in order to establish a presence. And a lot of conductors have gotten a lot of money and they hope it's going to continue forever. I cannot see this continuing forever because I cannot imagine that either the Polygram Group or Sony or the allied figures, EMI, Bertelsmann, RCA, whatever, are making any money at all on this. And eventually, somebody's going to have to say no. And once that happens, then you're going to have a shakeout, as far as I'm concerned, because you're not going to have one person standing there when everybody else backs off. But I think it's going to have to be Sony. <laughs> Norio Oga, who is president of Sony today, is a part-time conductor. This is a man who gets up in the small hours every night to study his conducting scores. But throwing large wadges of yen is not going to solve the conducting crisis, and Sony could well find itself in a very few years without any new stars of the podium, in the podium, without anyone left to record. When Sony came into the business, they obviously were intent upon signing up big star names. They had a deal going with Carrie and unfortunately for them, Carrie Anne died in the arms of Mr. Ogre, who was a great, great fan of Carrie Anne's. Then they signed up Bernstein, and of course, Bernstein did exactly the same thing, he died. Then they signed up um, Horowitz, and he died. <laughs> and I think they're now in considerable difficulty. Carrie Anne and Bernstein were the two great icons, conducting icons, and in a way, they were also the two great cash cows of the, of the record business. Suddenly with the demise of those two almost within a year of each other, the bottom is falling out of the full price record market because there are no similar star names around.
What is happening now? You have, first of all, schools in which they, they learn to conduct. So what's happening there? They stand in front of mirrors and make their movements, you know, and that's the, the way they learn conducting. I know of a lot of young conductors who conduct and have nice movements. They can't even play their scores on the piano. They can do nothing. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing is we have these competitions. Now, everybody knows about these competitions. All right, uh, I, I'm against all these competitions to begin with. It's like, like uh, Olympiades, you know, uh, Olympics, uh, who plays faster uh, and, and, and more perfect and more perfect. But all right, with, with instruments, uh, with instrumentalists or singers, you can at least find out, okay, there's some tremendous genius uh, or, or tremendous talent playing the violin or so. But with conductors? You, uh, that's why we have so many conductors now. We never had so many before, and yet so very few. In our time, it is usual that there come young conductors and they have, they have heard four or five uh, CDs and they learn and they make copies and that's not the right way. With a conductor today, their first Tristan is recorded and a video is made of it and it's over with. You know, we never heard Furt Bangler's Tristan till he had conducted Tristan about 700 times and after a while there was an interpretation there. You know, I mean, I think one of the problems for young conductors is this need for instant results. You know, and frankly, that's not part of our business. It's come to the point where there are very few concerts or opera performances that you can go to in expectation of hearing an outstanding performance. Perhaps an occasional Carlos Kleiber or Klaus Tenstedt or George Scholte. But these are rarities. They're representatives of a fading breed. Carlos Kleiber commands a great deal of respect. You feel that the orchestra is trying terribly hard to play the piece the way he wants it. And in fact, over and, and above that, they are trying to play their very best for each other, for him, for the performance itself. Uh, and that's what makes, for me, his performances so exciting. I think this man has everything. He's a wonderful musician, has fantastic technique is that, you know, it's just great personality. Klaus Tenstedt is special. He, that is, he's one of the greatest conductors in the world, I think, because he molds the music in an organic way that seems totally natural. It's a, a gift which he can transmit to the players and of course the players produce the sound the performance goes on and the public hear something special even if they don't know much about music I think they realize they're hearing something special for a performance to be great as opposed to adequate. The conductor has to live every note of the music from beginning right the way through, through to the end. He has to have a total passionate commitment. He has to feel every bar. And that's why for a lot of conductors, for people like Tenstedt, it's a very draining experience to conduct, especially if you're not in particularly good health. You have to have that element. You look at Toscanini on film. He's one of the most boring conductors in the world to watch. He appears to look like some sort of Italian bandmaster beating time. No demonstration, nothing, nothing glamorous to look at from the audience's point of view. But I bet you that something was coming through him, through his eyes, through his whole being, that let that orchestra know that he was part of them and with them all the way through the piece. We have been fortunate in the past to have had a whole generation or two generations of major conductorial figures. You cannot manufacture a conductor. You cannot fake a conductor. 
You cannot create a personality of modest talent into a supposed major interpreter. It doesn't work. These questions would never be asked two generations ago because everybody knew then that conducting was a slow, maturing process. Conductors took responsibilities for their orchestras, shaped those orchestral instruments the way they envisioned the music they wanted to do. That is almost a thing of the past. Today we have much more orchestras than ever before. It's a worldwide phenomenon. We have hundreds of orchestras in the world, symphony orchestras, or thousands probably. I don't dare to count it. And some of them is marvelous. So the profession became, on the one hand, more difficult because the people are expecting more from you. On the other hand, it's much more easier because you can conduct all over the world good orchestras. We are in a period where we have supreme technical excellence, where, where performances are as polished and as well performed as we have a right to expect, in many ways better than they were in the golden days. But technical excellence doesn't mean interpretive excellence. I, I do think the chances of, of a real individual performance emanating from the podium are less good now than they were 30 years ago. I think an empty musical performance uh, is a waste of time. I'd rather hear a lot of mistakes and have the music move me than hear a brilliantly articulated performance that says nothing. And we hear a lot of those now. Quite a few of my colleagues are really quite famous, and they've done nothing for music uh, except uh, bring it to, to the state we find it in, in many and many corners of the world. That is something which is totally dissected and removed from the needs of people to hear in music uh, reflected their own feelings and their own emotions and to have the feeling that they've participated in an experience which is going to change their lives. So we need a generation of conductors that are able to communicate meaning, not just the formal terms of music making, who themselves are courageous figures who stand for something and have a civic profile the same way Toscanini could defy Mussolini. And it was a public gesture of an artist that had enormous political, social, and moral consequences. Because Toscanini knew that a Beethoven symphony wasn't about do we follow the metronome marks or not. It was about defying tyranny, for example. And that as an artist, one was a complete being, a social and a moral being as well as an artist. That's the task now for conductors. We need conductors who can stand up and say something in this world that is falling apart in front of our very eyes and use this fantastically precious classical repertoire that we have as a way of conveying the highest aspirations of a society.